Hi, everybody. My name is Lisa Del Bono. I'm one of the uh, co-coordinators uh, for Michigan, and I co-lead the health action team for Citizens Climate Lobby. I'm really glad that you're here today. You know, I listened to an interview of Representative Curtis the other day when he was talking about the Clim Conservative Climate Caucus, and he mentioned how he wished he had some data that could inform his decisions about the best way to reduce emissions. And in thinking about that, I cannot think of a better way to do that than looking at uh, MIT's global climate action simulator called En-ROADS. It's really a macroeconomic model, uh, what they call a systems dynamic model that has been extensively tested and calibrated against a whole suite of other climate models. So it's a very reliable. It uses um, middle of the road emission scenario, so not the highest and not the lowest, but a middle of the road uh, projection on emissions. And even though it's not specific to the US, one can evaluate the relative effectiveness of the different um, measures being simulated and how they would work together to reduce emissions. That's a real beauty of this model. So what I would like to do first is actually go to the actual website. Um, and you know, it's a complicated website. It's an interesting website. There's a whole host of different graphs that we can look at, but we're gonna focus on two. We're gonna look at the energy mix from 2000 to 2100 and the net greenhouse gas emissions over that same period of time. We'll also look at this number on the far right, which tells us our, our average global temperature increase by the, by the end of the century, 2100. It's at 6.5 degrees Fahrenheit um, if we do nothing at this point. But uh, experts have told us that if we want to avoid the worst impacts of climate change, if we wish to avoid the tipping points, uh, we should try to keep that average global temperature under 2.7 degrees Fahrenheit. So that's what our goal is going to be, is to reduce emissions so that we can keep this temperature increase under 2.7 degrees. Down below is a whole host of things we can utilize to reduce emissions. So let's start digging and start looking at them. What if we were to plant uh, trees in a fashion similar to maybe the Trillion Tree Act? Well, we can simulate that by looking at afforestation. You hit those three little dots and you see, well, what is it that they're talking about with afforestation? And what it is, is we would plant new forest and restore old forest over, say, 100% of the available land, not 1,000%, 100%. What would happen then? We know trees sequester carbon, certainly a good thing to do. I love trees, it'd be beautiful and uh, good for the spirit and the mind and it would reduce emissions. Um, it would take a while for the trees to grow and we would take our average global temperature and decrease it by 0.2 degrees Fahrenheit. So it's definitely a good measure, but it, it by itself is not gonna get us down to the kinds of emissions reductions we need to avoid the worst uh, impacts of climate change. So let's um, move our lever back to uh, ground zero and take a look at another effort that we could try. We could um, try to improve our infrastructure and uh, put in pol put policies in place that incentivizes electrifying our transportation system. We know that electric engines are much more energy efficient than the internal combustion engine. So it's, a, it's really a logical thing to do. And what would happen if we were to do that? Well, our emissions would come down and our average global temperature would also come down by by about 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, again, another good measure, but by itself, it's not gonna be quite enough. So um, what we need to do, what I'm going to do now is go back to the PowerPoint. I've actually taken screenshots of different simulations. We'll just move through the whole thing a little bit more quickly if we do that. So what I want you to do now is to put your eye on the left-hand chart and take a look at, at the nuclear. It's this very light blue, barely visible line. Um, this is the amount of nuclear in our mix uh, um, right now. And what if we were to introduce policies that would incentivize building new nuclear plants? Let's move the lever um, to the right and see what happens. Well, we see that wedge definitely increases, so we're using more nuclear. Um, and we see that our emissions again come down to about 6.4 degrees, so just down 0.1 degree 
uh, Fahrenheit in terms of our average global temperature increase. So a good thing to do, but we need to do more. Let's really focus on this energy supply and do um, some other things to change up our energy mix. Let's uh, put in measures that would disincentivize the use of fossil fuels, increase uh, the incentive to use renewables and nuclear, and let's see what happens to our emissions. Now they have really come down and our average global temperature increase is down to 5.3 degrees Fahrenheit. So we're making some real progress. We need to do more. So what if we, at this point, increase our energy efficiency of our transportation and building sectors and electrify both of them? What happens then? Keep your eye on this left-hand chart and look, and look at what happens. We can see that as we move these levers to the right, the amount of energy we need is just less. It's certainly a good thing to do. Um, our emissions come down and our average global temperature is down to 4.2 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, the way that um, I've, we've looked at this so far is doing one lever at a time. And each one of these things would probably be a separate legislative or regulatory uh, policy. And we know that it takes time to introduce legislation or regulations. So the question is, is there some... Is there a single policy that would achieve similar results? And the answer is yes. We could actually put a price on carbon like the Energy Innovation Act and we would see equivalent emission reductions and our average global temperature increase would be down to 4.3 degrees Fahrenheit, uh, uh, similar to all those individual mes measures. So let's take a look at what we're talking about when we're talking about a carbon price like the Energy Innovation Act, we would hit those three little dots and look at it more closely. Now, this is a market incentive for real change. And the way it works is this. Um, we would put a price on, green, on the uh, CO2 or CO2 equivalent produced by uh, a fossil fuel product. And the, the fee would be administered to the fossil fuel companies. Um, so at its source, when it comes out of the ground or into the country, and the fossil fuel companies would pay the fee and probably pass the fee down to the consumer. It would start relatively low at $15 per ton, and it would uh, increase in a very predictable, transparent way by either $10 or $15 over time, creating a very, very clear price signal. So businesses can prepare for this change, pre prepare for the cost being passed down, and innovate. Um, so that they can, in fact, produce the same product um, or, uh, or service using less fossil fuels, less carbon intensive energy. And that's where the beauty of the market takes place. It's that market in incentive to transition to a clean, um, to a non-carbon form of uh, energy. What it also does is it puts the financial incentives to introduce other policies that would improve energy efficiency and electrification of our transportation and building sectors. And if we were to add those policies in, we'd, we, found, we would find that our average global temperature would actually come down to 3.8 degrees Fahrenheit. Now, when we had looked at this sector by sector, uh, without a price on carbon, our average global temperature increase was 4.3 degrees. So you can see that it's much more efficient. We have actually amplified the effectiveness of the energy efficiency and electrification by adding the price up on carbon. The other thing that a price on carbon does is it allows for a rebate of the fee to businesses that can capture carbon and sequester it. So we can simulate that by moving this technology uh, lever a little bit to the right under carbon removal. And it, doing that, we can get down to 3.6 degrees Fahrenheit. So again, that rebating the fee support spurs more innovation towards carbon capture and sequestration. Then we can do additional initiatives which are not directly related to the price on carbon. We could improve our agricultural techniques. We know that um, 
more healthy soils capture carbon. So that would be a wonderful thing to do. We could reduce green, other greenhouse gas emissions and doing those things in combination, we could get down to three degrees Fahrenheit uh, by 2100. So we uh, average global temperature. So we're coming very close to that 2.7 degree average global temperature increase that the scientists tell us we need to get under. So if we, at this point, to restore our forests and plant our trees and green our living spaces, we actually could get under that 2.7 degrees average global temperature. So our take-home points are this. We can, in fact, stay under 2.7 degrees average global temperature, but it's going to take a comprehensive package of climate initiatives, and there's clearly no time to waste. I hope I've convinced you um, that a price on carbon is absolutely essential because it is clear from looking at these the MIT simulator that it is clearly the single most effective and inexpensive lever to reduce emissions. It's using market forces to create clear price signals that spurs innovation and acts as a solutions multiplier to incentivize electrifying our transportation and builders, building sectors, improve energy efficiency, and um, spur innovation like carbon capture and sequestration. I hope you found this, this presentation helpful, and I am so appreciative of the work you're doing and looking at um, addressing climate change. Thank you so much for your time.